It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry Lasseur and Walter Cronkite. Our distinguished guest for this evening is T. Coleman Andrews, Commissioner of Internal Revenue. Mr. Andrews, you've been on this job of collecting our taxes for a little more than a year now, and you've been pretty quiet about it. But before I ask you about the work you've done so far, I'd like to ask, if I may, just what your qualifications were for this vitally important post. Maybe I should say first that a lot of people don't think I've been so quiet about it. But in any event, uh, I'm basically, of course, uh, an accountant. Uh, management and organization has been my business for a long time, and I've taken several excursions from practice into public affairs. And uh, in addition to that, I've had administrative responsibility in the military services and Marine Corps during the war. And I like to think, at least, that the president and the secretary employed me because they think that we did the jobs that we did in the past pretty well. I hope that's the reason. Well, you're also a Democrat, too, aren't you, sir? That's right, a conservative Democrat. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Commissioner, in this year that you've been in the job, have you discovered any evidence that the American public is indulging in widespread shirking of their duty and evasion of taxes? No, we haven't, and I, I don't think they are, as a matter of fact, uh, because we, we have a rather interesting situation in this country. We've found that the average American taxpayer uh, has a pretty high respect for his government, is willing to carry his share of the load of the cost of it. And if it were not for that, then I'm afraid that we would have been in trouble a long time ago. We figure that about 97% of all the people in this country pay their taxes uh, voluntarily. We, we call it voluntary compliance. They come up at tax paying time and said, Mr. Tax Collector, here's what uh, I figure my income is, and I figure the tax is so much, and here it is. Well, that's a mighty healthy thing for the economy of this country and for the stability of its tax system. Too. Well, Mr. Commissioner, I'm afraid that most of us feel that the other fellow is getting away with a little more than we are. Now, is there anything against listing every possible deduction and expense on your income tax? No, there's not only nothing against it. We want people to do that. We, we want every taxpayer to get the benefit of every deduction that the law allows him. And where there are optional ways of computing one's tax, we want him to have the way that is least expensive to him. It'll take the least amount of money out of his pocket. For instance, take the matter of the standard deduction. Uh, there may be, in most cases, uh, a wage earner will take the standard deduction because it's simple. He doesn't have to worry about itemizing his deductions. But suppose somebody has a, a, a bad spell of illness during the year and his doctor's bills and hospital bills run up high, or maybe something disastrous occurs to him like flood or something of that kind, or his house catches fire. Uh, that sort of person should sit down and make his deductions in detail so as to see whether or not it's to his advantage to take them that way or to claim the standard deduction of 10 percent. Whichever you, way is to his advantage, we want him to take it. Do you mm -hmm. feel that there are many people in the United States overpaying their taxes by uh, not completely understanding the tax laws? Well, uh, there isn't any doubt about that. It's not a matter of feeling. There, there are a great many people who overpay. For instance, uh, in the taxpayer canvas that we've talked about uh, and you've read a lot about, we found a great many people who had overpaid as well as a lot, of course, who hadn't paid enough or who hadn't paid anything at all. And we issue every year a great many refunds to all types of taxpayers, individuals, corporations, and partnerships, trusts, and so on, indicating uh, an excess payment of taxes. I'd ask you about, about that. that house to house canvas that mm -hmm. you just mentioned. Uh, some newspapers called that Operation Snoop called it Gestapo methods, that you went around asking people at their homes whether or not they'd paid their taxes and, uh, and demanded proof that they had and so forth. Now, what do these fellows actually do in your canvas, and what do they accomplish, sir? Well, this Operation Snoop, of course, was a little bit of uh, what I call uh, uh, 
journalistic ingenuity. Of course, if I were a newspaper reporter, I'd be pretty proud of having invented that one, but actually, of course, that isn't what it is. Uh, all in the world we do is to go from door to door and check on whether or not the people at each residence have filed a return. It's not a snoop in any sense. There's no barging into people's homes or anything of that kind. We don't even go in the home unless we're invited and then don't usually go. If a person declines to answer our questions or doesn't want to answer them, why they don't have to and there's no hard feelings on anybody's part, we don't get mad at anybody about it. And the fact of the matter is it has been a very pleasant experience. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, well, I remember in New England in the entire canvas up there in the first month when it first came to light that uh, seemed to be something unusual, which it wasn't, of course, because the tax laws have on that subject been on the books in its present form since 1926. We didn't have any difficulty. There was only one person in several thousand who even uh, seemed to get to uh, be unhappy about it. It's not a snoop. It's merely an effort to find out that everybody is on the tax rolls who should be on that. Mm -hmm. So that everybody will pay his fair share of the taxes as Congress intended. And I, our reaction, or rather, our experience is that the average person is glad to know that this uh, examination is being made by us and that uh, everybody is going to be paying just like he is. I might say that uh, since we started it, or rather since we resumed it, that it's being done elsewhere. I know right now, for instance, of one state and one important city where exactly the same thing being done on the state level in the first instance and on the local level in the other. Well, Mr. Commissioner, what exactly, what ex tax dodges are you cracking down on? Are there any outstanding forms of evasion? Well, of course, the people that, uh, that we are particularly interested in apprehending on the tax dodging aspect of it are the people who deliberately set out to evade the payment of their taxes, either by not filing a return at all, or else by uh, understating their income or overstating their deductions. And uh, I'm sure if we had time on this program to read just some of the cases to let people see what was happening, there'd be no doubt about the wisdom and propriety of what we're doing to catch the evader. Is there any now, particular segment of the economy where there is more evasion than any other? Well, uh, I think that question could probably be answered affirmatively. You usually find, of course, uh, uh, in the people engaged in illegal pursuits, for instance, they don't want to disclose their income, probably because uh, they uh, just don't operate on, the, on a legal basis in the first place, and secondly, because perhaps they're afraid that if they did, why, then uh, the illegal activities would become known and would become subject or caught up with on, on their criminal pursuits. Well, how about legitimate mistakes? You know, it's a pretty tricky form you make us fill out, Mr. Commissioner. Well, we don't think it's tricky. Uh -huh. uh, I don't want to challenge you on that too strong because I know what you're trying to get at and I'd like to get at, but let, let me, let's, let's, be, uh, let's get that cat out on the ridge pole, for instance. We tried a bunch of high school students and we find that they make one-twelfth as many errors as the average taxpayer. So if high school students can make this out, I'm pretty sure that the average adult taxpayer can do it. Of course, as they don't knock out to pay any taxes on that form. They just filled out. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> we point. had one classroom recently that 75% of those kids had to pay taxes. They had earned over $600 last year. Well, Mr. Commissioner, one of the main criticisms <laughs> I've heard against the income tax laws is that they seem to favor the businessman and not the wage earner. Now, most of us are salary makers, and we <coughs> just make our legitimate business deductions. But it seems rather unfair that the... Uh, the man in business can make more, depreciation, that sort of thing. Well, of course, on its face, I suppose that's true, but uh, you have to get down to the bedrock economy or economics of a question of that kind. Uh, anything that is done to simplify the problem of business in complying with its tax obligation redounds ultimately to the credit of the individual. Why? Because all taxes that I know anything about except their state and gift taxes uh, goes into the cost of product which the individual has to buy. While uh, he may not, uh, he may think that the business enterprises are getting all the benefit uh, because that's where the simplification occurs. Actually what happens is that 
in a final analysis, he's getting an indirect benefit by a lower cost of the things he has to buy. So it's not correct to say that merely because you change a portion of the law that affects business that it's unfair to the individual. That's a very short-sighted and narrow point of view. Well, what about people who say in show business where their talents do tend to depreciate? We'll take an actress whose beauty may be her chief talent. Now, uh, isn't this rather unfair to her? Do you consider this unfairness? Well, I think that's a very unfortunate situation, but that brings up a rather interesting question. And that is, uh, as to just where do I fit into the tax picture? We are the enforcers of the tax law. It's up to us to collect the taxes that Congress says shall be levied and assessed and collected. A problem of that kind is a matter of tax policy. Congress determines tax policy in the final analysis. The administration, acting through the Secretary of the Treasury and the Undersecretary, determine who shall pay what taxes and at what rates. Therefore, a problem of that kind, even though it may be distressing, is not one that I have any power to correct. It has to be corrected by high authority, and of course, Congress has to accept any suggestion on that score. So the final question, Mr. Andrews, what advice could you give the average wage earner to uh, make his deduction? How can he prove it to the, uh, your uh, collectors? Well, the average wage earner, of course, uh, his taxes are withheld. So he doesn't have any particular problem of knowing how much tax he ought to pay. I think every person ought to keep a pretty good record of what they spend so that if at the end of the year it's to their advantage to claim their deductions in detail, they would do that rather than claim the 10% uh, overall deduction or standard deduction because they save money that way. I see. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner Andrews. It's been a privilege to have you here tonight. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure to meet you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Walter Cronkite. Our distinguished guest was T. Coleman Andrews, Commissioner of Internal Revenue. A priceless attribute of every Longines watch is pride of possession. It brings to its owner the satisfaction of knowing that he owns the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of all the world. Yes, a Longines watch brings more than the delight of a beautiful possession, more than the unsurpassed timekeeping of a remarkable watch. For that Longines watch of yours is the one and only world's most honored watch. Only Longines among the finest watches of the world has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors from government observatories, and a position of preference in sports, aviation, and in science. For Easter, for a graduation, an anniversary, a birthday, for any important gift occasion, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines. And yet, unbelievably, you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty. Longines, the world's most honored watch the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. There is only one Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Lacoultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by unfailing daily variations in the temperature of the air. Atmos, product of Lacoultre, division of Longines Whitnor. <laughs>